Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. So there is a book coming out, so I've heard. Oh, rumor has it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have been working on this book for a while. Yes. And um, aside from the outreach and intervention training manual that we have, this is the first um, proper comprehensive book um, that we've produced as Exodus Cry Magic Lantern Publishing Company. Um, it's called Raised on Porn. And um, if you've seen our documentary Raised on Porn, you'll notice that it's the same title, same cover. Um, Benji, tell us how how this book came about, why write a book, um, and you know the, the elevator pitch of what this book is. Okay, so when we got into investigating the subject of pornography and the porn industry and all this, um, we were looking for resources out there to educate ourselves. And this that season began in 2012 in a, in a very like focused way. So we had done some prior research um, going way back. When we started filming Nefarious in 2008, we were seeing how pornography overlap with sex trafficking. So at that time, we didn't know what Nefarious would be. So we started to, to look into what was out there during that time. Then in 2012, after Nefarious came out, we realized, okay, that storyline isn't going to fit in this film, but let's look deeper into this. We were looking for resources out there. We found a number of really good resources, but nothing that fit the mold of what we felt like was needed from the standpoint of kind of one comprehensive, robust, and in-depth book to help people understand both what pornography is, its impact on us, and how we can heal from that impact individually, in relationships, with our children, in society. So, um, so as, we were, as we were doing this research, we, um, we started to kind of assemble our findings from different resources. Lot, so we had to read a lot of different books, different journals that had been written. Um, and conducted our own research. And at some point along the way, some few years into it, decided with another colleague, you know what, this, this actually, like the resource that we were looking for, we can actually make that resource. Mm -hmm. So we can begin to put all of this together into um, a book, into a larger resource. And as storytellers, I think that's part of our our gift. This movement is is helping to package things in a, in a way and in a narrative and in a compelling way that connects with people. And um, so, for me, this book is really embodies what I wished was there mm. when I first got into this. And again, it's not to take anything away from the resources that were out there, but just to say that this is we. I, I wanted to craft this in a way that is a sort of like one-stop shop for anyone interested in the entire larger subject of pornography. Mm -hmm. Something I know we're asked at Exodus quite a lot is about resources. And so we put together a, a whole page on um, our Protect Children Not Porn website that has lots of different resources um, that other organizations have, uh, provide or services um, but I think it's really important and powerful that we're compiling our own resource. And to me, it's like some of the, the most profound messages of three of our films, I believe, actually, of Liberated, Raised on Porn and Beyond Fantasy, um, looking at human rights violations in the porn industry. All of those themes are in this book. And to, to really stare at the subject of pornography and give a full critical analysis, but not just, you know, there, there's some good research out there yeah. too, but it doesn't offer the real practical help. And just really taking that inventory of p what are people wanting and needing in the conversation around pornography? Like, what could we... Access to Cry provide as the best offering, the best resource that we believe everyone needs to um, to be armed with. And so that kind of leads into my next question of who is this book for? Yeah. Who is the target audience? Who do you envision reading it? Well, you mentioned three films. There's three other ones as well. Buying Her, Porn's Impact on Fueling Demand, mm -hmm. High Class, how from the perspective of people 
in sex trafficking situations, how pornography was brought to them mm -hmm. to perform, and then entering porn land. So the individual stories of people who went into the porn industry and all of that. So, so some those three have not been released yet. Yes, yes, yes. Six okay. films of ours. Yeah. It's yes. amazing. So some people may think, well, didn't I already see the documentary raised on porn? You know, I, I think I got it. And so, no, raised on porn actually doesn't just cover what's in that documentary. It covers what's in six documentaries and way, way more. So the whole point was that with our documentaries, we're very limited in terms of what we're able to, the story that we're able to tell in like, you know, a handful of minutes, you know, 30 to 90 minutes. Um, whereas with the book, we were able to go much more in depth and, um, and, and a little bit broader in scope. So I think that it will be a valuable resource for a wide demographic of people. First of all, just for anyone who has been exposed to pornography, I think it's really helpful to get a framing of what that experience was, whether you've seen it once or a hundred times or 10,000 times. It's, it's really helpful to get a, a framing of what that experience was. So I think it's gonna provide a framing for people who have had exposure to porn that were affected by it in some way. Maybe it created shame, confusion. Uh, maybe they can't get that image out of there. They, have, they haven't been able to reconcile what it was because there was also a pleasure component to it. And what did, I, what did I even see? So I think it will speak to the audience of people who have had exposure to pornography, which is basically everyone. Um, not every single person, but 99.9% .9 of people. And um, so I think it'll be helpful to that demographic of people because it, the book provides a very, very clear framing for this issue of pornography. Um, I think that parents will definitely want to get a hold of this. Don't wait till you're in the crisis to with your child to then go get the resources. Mm -hmm. Get the resources now. Because a lot of things that I talk about in the second half of this book are preventative measures for you know how to protect your children from exposure to porn and its influence. But then also like the scenario of, okay, it's oftentimes not a matter of if, but when. So you are more prepared for what seems to be likely an inevitable situation where at some point your child has some inadvertent exposure to pornography or maybe intentional. But um, so I think that it's, it's helpful for parents. Pornography has affected relationships. This is something that doesn't get talked about very much. So we talk about, a lot of times we talk about porn's impact on like an individual, you know, people's struggle with porn or whatever it is. Um, and then we talk a lot about, you know, childhood exposure to pornography. And and there's a lot being done now by us to <laughs> to address that and and a lot of other good people and organizations out there as well. So there's there's movement happening around um, pornography exposure to children. What doesn't get talked about a lot is the betrayal trauma mm. that people experience in a relationship when they're, it comes out that their partner has been consuming pornography. And the person who experiences that betrayal trauma is not a conscious choice. They don't, and, and a lot of times what happens is the person experiencing that betrayal trauma, first of all, you don't get to decide to experience that or not. It, it is something that that can invoke. The, sh the shame and isolation around that is I'm experiencing betrayal trauma, but I don't feel like this is a legitimate reason to feel this. So I don't feel validated in what I'm feeling. So I'm so then that person becomes isolated with that very intense and what can become toxic trauma. And so I think that this book is really helpful for people who are in relationships to frame for them what you're experiencing, what you're going through, and to create a sort of, um, I don't want to say middle ground, but to create a, a, a framework for couples to tackle this issue together. 
they may be in two different places. One partner may be think one thing, the other one may think another thing. I would say, get this book, read through it, and understand each other better to initiate a dialogue. Mm-hmm. There's got to be, you know, if you're if you're going to hope to find a way to reconcile your relationship. Um, so, and then there's you know situations where. Um, so yeah, so I, without going on and on about that, I think that uh, this this book is helpful for couples. Now, some people out there go, well, I'm you know I'm in a relationship, but neither of us neither of us has ever struggled with pornography, and I would say to that, wonderful, amazing, that's great. But I guarantee you, two or three other couples that you know have. Mm-hmm. So one of the most common things that happens to me is people go, hey such and such couple is going through this thing and they need to know what to do and you know around porn and and so i so then i'll just parse out these few chapters and say here send them this and um so part of it is for people that are in relationships uh not just for your own situation but how can i be helpful to people around me that are struggling in their relationships. Mm, um, yeah. And so- uh, I think just being a, a responsible human and operating in empathy is considering that like this is one of the largest public health crises of our time. Um, if it, like you said, if it doesn't or hasn't impacted you directly, it'll impact a family member, a friend, a, a child, a future child. Like we are bombarded right now in our culture more than at any other time in history with pornography. And so I think that, you know, and, um, you know, personally as a, as a Christian, as a person of faith, I think it's really, um, I, I want to be aware of things and even I think knowledge is, is powerful. And I want to be able to have answers for questions of people that might come to me. Like to me, it's, um, it's wanting to not turn a blind eye to things that are uncomfortable or taboo, or like, I don't want to know about things that are heavy and dark, yeah. but actually if in empathy, seeing the havoc in our culture that this issue is causing, arming yourself with knowledge, educating yourself and um, collecting uh, a powerful resource so that you can be someone um, that offers a response and offers encouragement and insight. Um, And especially in this day and age where therapists are encouraging couples to watch porn together. Like I think that is um, a, a huge red flag and one of the most alarming things that I've, we have people sending us posts of, uh, a well-known therapist on on Instagram on social media saying this therapist is advocating for porn use for couples. Um, I've had friends say to me, um, I, I I raised the issue of how um, my boyfriend's porn addiction was really um, causing me you know so many issues, and the therapist wasn't trying to it was trying to say well. Um, you know, well, this really isn't an issue. His his porn addiction isn't an issue. Your response is the issue. So let's break down your response and how how we can figure out how for you to be okay with what he's doing. Because, you know, every guy watches porn. That's not a problem. And this girl, this friend of mine was like, wait, therapists are having that mindset that porn is completely normal. And so any partner who has an issue with their partner watching porn, they're the problem. So the fact that that information is even out there means to me more than ever, people need to read the truth of really how, like how does porn impact uh, people, relationships, um, and our culture, and, and what can we do about it? Therapists recommending couples to use porn to enhance their relationship would be like a personal trainer recommending electric th- shock therapy to like build your muscles. It, it's just It just makes no sense at all. And clearly... You have to be deeply out of touch with the truth and the reality and the well-researched findings that show how destructive pornography is, um, just the way electric shock therapy would be to your heart. Like it just it. So, I somewhat chuckle at that notion, and and it it would be funny if it wasn't so utterly disturbing that there are therapists out there like that. Um, It goes back to this thing of people in our culture thinking they're being cool by being cool with pornography. And I talked about it in another podcast, how 
people think they're cool by putting a Playboy sticker on their car. Like how out of touch do you have to be with the reality of what Playboy actually was on 10 different levels to think that that's not only acceptable, but somehow cool. And I think that some therapists think, ooh, I'm being taboo and rebellious and and like embracing this idea of porn chic and it's a little tantalizing, but I'm cool with that. And it's just, it's just so not cool. It's like you are a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. Like your your job is literally to research the, these things and to ensure the well-being uh, of the people that you are providing therapy to. How dumb and ignorant and disconnected do you have to be to arrive at that conclusion? Like what is your own narcissistic vain need for affirmation from the culture that's driving you to make this absurd recommendation? It's literally ridiculous. Uh, to the 10th degree on steroids, to the thousandth power. So I, I don't know how, like you cannot exaggerate the point of how utterly disconnected uh, and depraved a recommendation that has to be to couples. I, I, I mean, it's literally like pouring gasoline on a bonfire. Like what, what are you talking about? You have a couple who's trying to work out real disconnection issues and you're, 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 you're recommending to them something that's going to poison, literally mm -hmm. poison their relationship. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's this whole cultural narrative of, um, if you're anti-porn, you're not sex positive to be sex positive, uh, and open-minded and, um, not prudish in any fashion is to be open-minded about all forms and all expressions of sexuality. There are no boundaries. Maybe the only thing that's slightly taboo is children and animals. Like those are the only things off the table, but literally everything else, if it's multiple partners, like literally the things that I'm hearing that some therapists are even advocating for couples and people exploring their sexuality is, I really believe, infused by pornography, like pornography has become the marketing fuel. Not only have we seen from our documentaries made of sex buyers who are buying trafficked individuals halfway across the world, um, the fantasy for them began with a porn addiction, um, but it's this it's this idea of, of a very twisted idea of what it means to be sex positive. And um, I think it was Gail Dines who said that um, porn is the opposite of sex positive it's the equivalent of saying um I, I like like I like food therefore I defend McDonald's it's like what McDonald's is to nutrition um porn is to sexuality or something of that nature like no we can critique a very toxic harmful destructive presentation of porn um something that the book talks about is this idea of a porn man and a porn woman mm -hmm. um what are the narratives of porn uh, that uh, that the porn industry and porn distribution, porn sites, um, what is the narrative that they tell men about men, men about women and vice versa? So let me just address one other thing because I want to I want to answer okay. that question. Who is this book for? It's for it's for couples, it's for parents, it's for um, school teachers, people people who are in educational institutions, it's for therapists, mm -hmm. it's for uh, researchers, it's for documentarians, it's, and it's for, here's what I want to say, it's for individuals who have a struggle with pornography um, and, and have had exposure to pornography. So one, there's a demographic of people out there that would say, I'm watching pornography consistently, but I don't want to. And I want to say that the framing around that struggle really does matter and it really does help. This book provides some very concrete paths towards freedom and healing for people that are struggling with porn. And to, to just kind of elaborate that on, on that for a second, um, for people that would say, well, yeah, but I, I kind of know that it's bad, but I still do it anyway. So I don't know that the framing really matters. What, there's a there's a saying in sales that when somebody says no, they just haven't been given enough information. And so I would say to those people that you think you know what's bad with porn, but you really don't. And I know for me that it, it's the, been the framing of this issue that in a way has like broken 
my like capacity to even have any interest in pornography. And um, so there's there's one, you know, kind of uh, argument out there that like, well, there's there's this erotic stimulation that will occur by virtue of watching porn. There's a dopamine hit. There's a surge of of sexual energy that somebody can can extrapolate or extract from watching pornography. And back to the previous point, you know, likely some therapists are thinking, well, I can trigger that kind of sexual surge, if you will, um, to do this. So, okay. So there is that. So you, you need a larger, you need a bigger story around that to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that bigger story, then you're at the same mercy to pornography that a person who has a f food addiction has to eating, you know, chocolate cake. It's yeah, the chocolate cake provides the surge. That's not enough of a reason for me to go around recommending chocolate cake to everybody. Like, oh, you're you're not you don't have you're not having enough, you know, uh, feelings of satisfaction on eating food. Go try chocolate cake. It, it's like yeah, you're gonna get that sugar high. You're gonna get those immediate feelings of satiation, but then you get a whole bunch of other stuff with that. And you're probably gonna have diabetes in a couple months if you keep it up. So like it's so what helps us not just eat chocolate cake all day every day is the larger framing around it. The understanding of what it's doing to our system, what the ingredients are. And so in the desire to live a balanced, healthy life, um just like objectively, obviously, you know, we're very self-sabotaging species, so we don't always do the things that we should do. But objectively, in the interest of of living a a, a happy, well balanced, healthy life, there's some framing around this issue of pornography that provides deeper uh, layers of information, a larger story that I do think is incredibly helpful at helping those people who would say, I want to get free from this. I haven't been able to. And I know that what I'm doing is already wrong. Mm -hmm. Like I know I've heard the stories. I saw your reels. I saw what Exodus Cry posted. I know that it's wrong, but I can't get free. I would say that you you need to dive in to the deeper narrative around this and that it is absolutely help, helpful because I've seen it impact so many people's lives in, that, in their journey to get free. Mm -hmm. So thinking of you know, the, the constitution of this book, the substance of it, what is it? Um, we uh, address, you know, first the issue of sexuality from the outset, that there are these three different categories of sexuality. There's not like a one size fits all sexuality um, and, uh, and sex isn't all good. So our culture so glorifies sex and uses it to make money in everything. It's, you know, advertising, movies, everything. Everybody is using this to prey upon that primal part of people to capture interest, right? The idea that sex sells. So with that, we've established a consciousness in our society that all sex is good sex. But obviously we know that's not true. Not all sex is good sex. In fact, probably most of the sex being had in our society and our culture today is not good sex. Like, and uh, by virtue of the pornographic culture that we live in. So we, at the very outset, just say, look, there, there are some different ways to understand sex. Not all sex is good sex. Sex has the capacity to bring about incredible harm into a person's life, to actually destroy a person's life. It has that capacity. So it has the capacity for great good and connection, but it also has the capacity for enormous harm and destruction. It has a capacity for both. So the three types of sexuality that, that I talk about at the outset are a relational sexuality, an object sexuality, and a malevolent sexuality. So the approach that we come into this book at is through this lens to help us see and discern and parse out what is healthy and good and relational and that which is um, can be destructive and harmful and abusive and, and all of that. And, um, and then we get into 
you know, the, the depths and layers of the scope of porn in our society, um, its uh, impact on us in a, in a number of different ways, the engineering of porn and how it's constructed for us to experience it. So what you mentioned, the porn man, the porn woman, the porn universe. So pornographers have been very intentional to create a universe in which we have an avatar to go into that universe vicariously. Pornography is meant to create a vicarious experience for the viewer to have an experience that is as personal as can be. So one pornographer told me that he has the girls say to the camera very intentionally, Mr. Oh, hi, Mr. Oh, will you do this to me, Mr.? The Mr. is so that the viewer at home can be that person. Instead of, so the porn man is, is crafted in a very intentional way. He has all power. He has all power. Many people watching this at home, men have this intrinsic longing to be powerful in their world. And most men do not feel powerful in their world, especially in their relationship with women and in their sexuality. So pornography provides this potent substitute that provides this vicarious experience of feeling powerful, but it's cotton candy. But it has, it, it's it, in a way kind of satisfies that, that need and lust for power. So it's very important in the porn universe for the man to have all power. Now, in order to do that, he has to be emptied of his humanity. So he has no empathy, no consideration for the female. He's just, uh, as as Gail Dines would say, he's just a life support system for his erect penis. The the male in in pornography is just there to dominate uh, the woman, to subjugate her, and ultimately to humiliate her in a sexualized context to demonstrate how powerful that he is. And then the porn woman. You know, in most cases, there are exceptions to this, and then there's lots to say about those exceptions as well. The porn woman is meant, she is the one who is being acted upon. And so she also is emptied of her humanity. She has no preference except to please and satisfy whatever this man wants. You want to ejaculate all over my face? That's exactly what I was hoping for, right? So every advance, no matter how violent, no matter how graphic, no matter how deviant, it just turns her on even more. So she's emptied of her humanity and cast into a role to play the ravenous sex panther who wants every sexual thing to happen to her. So women who are entering in this world through the avatar of the porn woman also internalizes her role in that world. Now, the idea that we can just walk away from pornography without being affected by that is just simply not true. So what we see now is when we talk about the pornification of society, we see 14-year-olds wanting to be choked and gangbanged. And it's like, where did that come from, right? It, it is the internalized and offloaded story of pornography onto vulnerable young people whose minds aren't developed enough to know the difference between what is good and bad sex. So this book helps in, this is one example of many, many um, scaffoldings and framings around this subject to give people insight, understanding, wisdom, revelation. I think that people will experience this book as deeply empowering. Mm. And I th I think that something in my mind that gives you so much m more of a deeper understanding and authority is the amount of interviews you've done with people in the porn industry. You're not just observing this from the outside and having read everything under the sun as far as research on porn. You've sat down with a lot of the people who are creating pornography, directing it, envisioning it, writing it, and survivors. And we've worked with, um, you know, both you and I in different capacities, many survivors of pornography who've talked about how it's impacted them. Um, and then um, in these last couple of years, 
since we did our Protect Children Not Porn campaign, have heard from so many people who were exposed to pornography as children. Um, and I know for me, like, the average age of pornography exposure right now is around 11 years old. We did an Instagram poll, several hundred people responded um, and it was actually younger than 11, it was 10. And what we're seeing is that age is actually getting slightly younger and younger each year as younger children are being given um, devices um, at seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. 62% um, of a study of 11 to 13 year olds were um, accidentally exposed. And so it's um, where there's never been such an easy exposure, such a young exposure and such a harmful, harmful content being made. Um, and I just think that you're, you're staring this issue in the face and writing about it and presenting, like you say, giving people a framework, like how do we understand this? This is, is such a, um, a, a toxic and painful and destructive thing that has impacted children, adolescents, relationships, um, there are you know, the stories that we have been told of um, of stories of sexual abuse related to pornography, the stories of tr teen trafficking survivors who pornography was used to groom them and to demonstrate what buyers wanted. Um, we need to get to grips with what is happening here and literally raised on porn, like Pornhub created an entire sex education wing of their whole website. Um, the porn industry has a vested interest in educating our young people. And I think that there needs to be this book and many others on helping people um, understand what's happening. I, I'm sure yeah. many people have never even heard that idea of the porn man or the porn woman or never even really considered what is the story that porn tells men and what is the story that porn tells women. Um, and I feel like with, you know, the OnlyFans explosion is, is women acting out in what um, the porn narrative um, of our culture has said that, um, men's attention is on porn men um this is what they want to see and this is the way that you become your own porn star like we're seeing the pornification of culture the commodification of women's sexuality and men's um and uh, more women than ever before are addicted to pornography um what what are some things that you break down in this book as far as tools like what is a starting point for people who want to get free who recognize the harm of porn like just you know People need to read the book to fully unpack it, but what are just a few things that you would say to people who are struggling but do want to get free? The first is somebody had to go run the gauntlet and find out what is going on here. Um, because it's like this. It's like we are, we're in this tribe where there's a plague that's broken out. It's, a, it's poisoning relationships. It's poisoning children. It's poisoning the community. The tribe is is in a crisis. People still have to go pull water from the well, till the fields, like life has to go on, but somebody needs to go out of the camp and go run the gauntlet and figure out what is going on in our tribe and come back with medicine. So when I first went on my first filming trip to uh, document what was going on in the, in the porn industry, I was sitting in the airport in Las Vegas about to return home after six weeks. And somebody sent me a dream that they had had the night before. This lady had this dream and she emailed it to me. And she said, I saw you and you were um, in these athletic clothes and you were walking into this um, mud pit, like a puddle of mud and you just kept going deeper and like a swamp. You were walking to like a swamp of mud and you just kept going deeper, 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 deeper till it, you were completely immersed. And she said, and then I saw you come walking up out of it. And she said, when you came walking up out of it, you were wearing a clean white athletic suit, but you were holding up the jacket that you were wearing from before. And you began to declare, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So I believe that we have been called on this unique ex assignment to go investigate and find out what's happening um, in this issue related to pornography. Uh, there's, in a way, there's this this plague that's broken out in the tribe to go find out what's happening and and a medicine that can be had for that. So it, this is the main thing 
that I have been thinking about for 15 years. And, um, and so we interviewed dozens of pornographers, dozens of people who's been uh, porn performers, dozens of experts and psychologists, neurologists, um, dozens of people who have had exposure to pornography, on and on and on and on. We, we have spent years and years and years, and we wanted to bring all of that to bear in one resource, all of that wisdom to bear into one resource to pass that on to the tribe, so to speak. And, um, and so I have found you know, this journey to be, on one hand, very difficult and challenging, but also very uh, meaningful and purposeful because I, I think it's just so important. So for somebody who is in this uh, cycle of, of pornography consumption, there's a lot to say. We could do a whole podcast just on that subject alone. Just one thought of this in terms of framing is a lot of people become trapped in a cycle of pornography consumption because of an unhealthy relationship with shame. And what I mean by that is that there's, there's healthy shame and there's unhealthy shame. Healthy shame is, um, I did bad, but I am not bad. Unhealthy shame is, I did bad because I am bad. So a lot of people have this ping pong relationship with shame and behavior, where the shame the the, the shame triggers the behavior, and then the behavior triggers the shame, and it's back and forth mm -hmm. between shame and behavior. So a lot of people frame their struggle around being a moral and spiritual struggle, as opposed to a uh, fantasy addiction and a neurological struggle, which is totally different. And, um, and so just something as simple as that, providing a very basic understanding to even know what their struggle is. And then in that, beginning to start to get underneath some of this stuff. And so one of the things that we recommend is to, because this is a fantasy addiction and a neurological struggle, what that means is that people are being triggered in this, you know, we live in a culture that's already a consumerist addicted culture without healthy outlets. So people's outlets are shopping, excessive social media, excessive sports, excessive drinking, excessive, we are an addicted, culture without healthy outlets. So just already looking at that, there's not a lot of healthy outlets, but understanding that there's this, you know, we're being triggered in this culture that we live in by anxiety, by a lack of connection, by isolation, by boredom, by rejection, by feelings of powerlessness, on and on. There are so many things that trigger us. And for somebody who's struggling to live in this modern day civilized society, civilized society that we've created, there are so many things that are not uh, organic to the way that we are supposed to, to, that we are wired to live as human beings are being um, triggered by that. And so, um, so the impulse is one of coping or escaping. So the fantasy of pornography provides a way to escape the feelings of anxiety and boredom and rejection into this fantasy world. So part of the work is disrupting the fantasy mm. and that, that takes work. Yeah. And so being self-aware when that trigger hits me, that my my triggers are leading me over to this fantasy to escape. I'm not bad. Like I'm human. And um start there. Have some self-compassion. Um but what is this fantasy world that's been constructed and and starting to do some work to disrupt the fantasy. So what I talk about in this book is the idea of 
disrupting and redirecting、mm. as a way to retrain the brain. So I said before, a fantasy addiction and a neurological struggle. So part of the problem of the fantasy addiction is that it wires the brain. To repeatedly go to the same thing, and we bear all this out with all kinds of studies and stuff. I don't, my point isn't to prove it right now or to go too in depth into it, but just to say that this is what happens in the brain. And so, in the but the beauty of our brain is that it can be rewired.、Mm -hmm. That's that's the incredible miracle of our brain is that once it's been wired one way, isn't the end of the story. We can actually rewire it another way. But the work to do that is to disrupt the fantasy at the point of trigger, and redirect into a healthy outlet. This cannot happen on the run. It, this cannot in, in our addicted, consumerist, vain culture without healthy outlets. It just will not happen on the run. You have to be intentional. If you just are living your life like oh it's all going to work itself out, you'll find yourself down a whole different path. Like the relationships you're in are just going to be relationships that happen to you. The pornography that you consume is just going to be something that happens to you. Life became becomes something that is happening to you instead of something that you are creating as a powerful person with intentionality. And the ability and capacity to make good decisions, and the power to follow through on those. So we have to bring people from a place of powerlessness and unhealthy outlets, and following their a, 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 a you know a pattern of neurological trajectory into this fantasy world. We have to recreate a, a, an entirely different approach to how, how we handle those triggers. In a simple way, it starts with disrupting and redirecting.、Mm. If I disrupt the fantasy at the moment of trigger, and redirect myself into a healthy outlet, something playful, something enjoyable. I take an e-bike ride. I take a walk. I go play cards with a friend. I go to a yoga class. On and on and on and on. We, there's we give a lot of examples of healthy outlets. Now. Over time, and really, I mean, it takes about three weeks to start the process of rewiring the brain. If I can do that for three weeks, build a wall around me with accountability and everything in it to do that for three weeks, and I fail three or four times, but I but I stay on that for three or four weeks. The brain starts to rewire itself. I start finding myself rather than when that when the trigger hits, rather than wanting to go eat a gallon of ice cream or go watch binge watch pornography. Now. I want to go for a walk. I want to go to a yoga class. Whatever the thing is. So, you know, and and the point of the book is that we can't cover all these things in a podcast or in one movie. There's a lot to discuss around this, and we felt that the that the vehicle of a book would be the primary tool. For people to be able to sit with this subject matter and their own struggle, and bring a couple friends into it, and and really digest kind of this entire subject matter in a way that I believe is going to bring freedom and healing and perspective to so many people that are struggling either individually or in their relationships or parents with children and so on. So, so good. That my mind is just spinning on on so many levels from that,、um, and I know that it's our hope that this book is really empowering for people. I feel like often、um, when people have struggle with porn addiction,、uh, our culture and even in the church, there can be this notion of well,、um, everyone struggles with this, or especially all men struggle. This is a very normal struggle, and almost a pacifier of you know. Unless something drastic happens, or you know, unless like God delivers you from this porn addiction, there's not really that much you can do. And I think that's actually a really harmful and, and passive perspective to offer people. I think there's so much empowerment and encouragement that can be given to people、um, to actually recognize the harm that this is causing themselves.、Um, other real women.、Um, 
you know, that I've, I've had many people share that the stories that we've told even on our social media of, um, of women who've been exploited or trafficked in pornography, that was what helped them even disrupt the fantasy. Um, and it's those stories that they bring to mind of reminding themselves like, this is a real person that's, you know, the fact that Pornhub doesn't, doesn't even verify age or consent, um, which we uncovered in, in 2020, the fact that um, women are coerced and trafficked in various means into this industry. It's a real human behind the screen and even helping, um, you know, disrupt that fantasy and our, our trilogy beyond fantasy. Um, and I, I really appreciate, I feel like it's such a tension to hold of um, that, healthy shame and unhealthy shame and people find it really hard to distinguish the difference because you know they might have not even heard that distinction before of healthy shame um for us we believe that if a child is exposed to pornography which is what most um children and adolescents are right now um it's the equivalent of a of a heroin dealer injecting kids in elementary schools playground that you're a victim of a, a neurological assault and um, a lot of people are acting out from this place of, of addiction or powerlessness, but there is a point when you can absolutely um, overcome this. Porn addiction is something that can be overcome. And I feel like that is a really important message that the, the book goes to the depths of exposing what is going on here. It, it doesn't hold back. We're just showing the harms of porn in a really bold yes. way that I appreciate because um, I feel like it takes courage to actually take on these topics and say the things that you have in this book but give such a message of hope, empowerment, encouragement, like anyone can overcome this. There's not a single person who um, the rest of their life, sorry, you've just got to struggle. And I've, I've over the years spoken to people who have struggled with porn for years and years and they feel hopeless. And I'm like, that is, if you can rearrange your thinking or have a different framework, I know that you can overcome this. I really, really believe that any human can overcome porn addiction. Um, and so I, I think, and you don't need to be rescued. You don't. Yeah. I've heard this it's perspective. It's not just a holy intervention and that's it. There's this, I've heard this perspective promoted that I, that I was just totally helpless and I had to be rescued. And there's an extent to which I get that. Um, there are all times in our lives where, you know, we need a rescue, so to speak, but that's not really a helpful way to think about a, you know, um, pattern of, Com pornography, consumpt consumption, yeah. uh, addiction, whatever you want to call it. Um, people have the power to overcome this. And that message needs to be heard. And, um, and so part of the goal of this book is to provide people with the tools to do that. Because if you only think, I just need to be rescued, A, you're probably just going to keep wallowing in that struggle, hoping for one day your moment of rescue to happen. And even if you do end up getting out of it through some rescue, then you're passing on a message that's disempowering other people as well. So it's not that I don't understand with compassion the place of feeling totally helpless. I do. Um, and um, But the, the reality, the truth, is that we have the capacity to... to step away from the cycle of pornography, addiction, whatever we want to call it. We believe that. We've seen these tools help set people free, find their freedom, and, and, and find their own power mm -hmm. as human beings in that, in a healthy way. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. I remember years ago, um, Russell Brand deciding to do a deep dive into researching pornography and the impact um, that it has on on the brain and the body, and he was so disturbed by the findings that he um, he began to sort of publicly announce like I'm 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 trying not to watch pornography. We'll see how long it takes. Um, I don't know if is it really possible for someone to stop watching porn. Like it, he even questioned his own um, moving away from porn because he didn't know if it really was possible, um, and and now has publicly spoken out about how he doesn't uh, watch porn and how unhealthy it is. And I remember being so encouraged by that, seeing like educating yourself 
understanding the harms not only to um, to yourself, your brain and body and relationships, but the other people um, that are being impacted in porn mm -hmm. and actually connecting in compassion and empathy um, is really, really important. And so, yeah, how can people get a hold of this book and any any final thoughts? Yeah, we want to make the book accessible to all. Uh, so it's you know, going to be available on the most accessible platform for getting books, which is Amazon. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that it's it's relevant to virtually everyone in our culture right now. I hope that as many people can get a hold of it as possible. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone, but 99.9% .9 of people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and we're also releasing an e-course training um, of the book to uh, go alongside it that will be released later this year. And so um, we want to help facilitate this conversation around small groups, communities, um, educators. And um, so keep an eye out for that as well. This is such an important conversation. I'm so glad that we're taking this um, head on. And thank you for writing this book. I really yeah. believe it's going to change a lot of lives. Absolutely. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exoduscry.com. And join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.